Okay, I guess we start. Welcome to my talk about uh, wear estimation for devices with EMMC flash memory. There you go. So here are some points about myself. I joined Toradex eight years ago, and I pretty much spearheaded the embedded Linux stuff there. And nowadays, we are our latest uh, Torizon platform is built all on mainline technology, with mainline U-boot, Distribute, with KMS, DRM graphics, Etnavi for Nuo, and OTA with OS3, Docker on top. Then, what do we cover today? I will give a brief overview of the technology. We look at the EMMC, of course. Check out how the flash health may be uh, analyzed there. And then we look at some ways to do IO tracking. And with all that, we can dive into the lifespan estimation. And then I will show that tool that we are working on, the flash analytics tool, and then the conclusions. So flash, it's pretty much the non-volatile memory of choice nowadays. For embedded systems, of course, it helped decrease the size, increase the robustness because there are no moving parts, and also reduce power consumption. But why would one even want non-volatile storage at the edge? Well, probably you want to keep some redundant data on site. For example, if you have any kind of intermittent connectivity problems, that you still keep your data there. So that's why it's ever increasing in size and importance for IoT stuff. Then, of course, it's a question, NOR versus NAND flash. The difference is basically at the transistor level, how actually bits are stored. Basically, it's either a NOR or the NAND gate at the logic gate level. Looking at NOR, it's simpler, the principle of operation. Also has higher reliability. But of course, it also usually has higher pin count and you get a lower density in silicon. So you need bigger size chips, which is more expensive. So usually, nowadays, NOR flash is only used in very special, specific applications when you have like really special, high critical, industrial grade requirements. You might still use NOR flash. The rest pretty much moved on to using NAND flash nowadays. What does that mean? How is the NAND structured at all? So the cell is the smallest entity, basically storing the data at the bit level. And then a page is the smallest array of such cells, and it's also what is addressable for read-write operations. And the write operation usually means that you're flipping bits from a one to a zero. And nowadays, page sizes are in the range of kilobytes. For example, the device we're looking at, it has four kilobytes. Then, the next entity is the erase block. It's basically an array of pages and it's the smallest unit that is addressable for erase operations. So there is no way you can just erase a page, you always have to erase a whole block, and that returns the state back from zeros back to one. The block size is usually in the range of megabytes, for example, four megabyte in the device I will demo. Unfortunately, erase operations are kind of slow, 
and also it's wearing out the flash over time. So when you do too many erase operations, basically it will develop bad blocks. That's why usually we're talking about block erase count, so it's an interesting, interesting metric basically how many times a certain block has already been erased. Then we can have single level versus multi-level cells. So it's about how many bits it can actually store. And this, of course, it depends on the voltage level thresholds. So a single level cell just stores one bit per cell. Then we have also kind of a intermediate thing, what is called pseudo SLC. It's basically a multi-level cell operating in SLC mode. So it, at the end, also only stores one bit per cell. A regular multi-level cell stores two bits, and then there are triple level, quad level, whatever, you get the idea. Of course, there is a trade-off between density and cost versus reliability and lifespan. So the more bits you can store, the less area you need, and it also is, of course, cheaper. But the drawback is that the reliability will be worse, and it also will, the lifespan will be worse. So that's why it gets more and more interesting to actually know what, how long it will survive, actually. That's what I'm talking about. Of course, you need ECC and taking care of bad blocks. Basically, only with error correction code algorithms you can even use those NAND flashes. You have to add some kind of level of redundancy, and that will allow correcting or even detecting certain bit error conditions. But be aware that even healthy blocks, they will, of course, have random bit flips. And only with that ECC, you can actually use it to store good data. But over time, when you use it, basically, every time you erase it again, you, the probability basically increases that you will get more and more bit flips. And at a certain point, your ECC will be too weak, basically, and that's when the block is worn out and it becomes bad. And usually, even from the factory, it can have uh, already bad blocks, the so-called factory bad blocks. And the way you handle the whole bad block stuff is you need to keep some spare blocks. And one by one, when they turn bad, you have to kind of replace them with those spare ones you keep. Another concept is the wear leveling. So the problem is if you would use the same physical block all the time, for example, if you have a certain file that needs updating all the time, it would increase the wear out and that would prematurely basically create bad blocks. So whatever those blocks would turn bad before all the others turn bad, that's kind of a bad idea, so you're trying to basically evenly distribute the wear out. And the only way that is possible is basically you also have to move the data around. One usually distinguishes dynamic versus this, uh, static wear leveling, and it's there, it's about uh, whether you only move the new data and leave kind of the static data there, or whether you even include the static data and try to re re redistribute that am among the whole device. Of course, it's better to use as much as all the space, basically, to distribute it, but that is, of course, also it requires uh, more complicated wear leveling algorithms. 
Another concept is garbage collection. Because as I mentioned before, the erase operation is kind of slow. So it would be a bad idea if you only then, when you actually want to write data, you then decide, ah, oh, now I have to kind of erase it. You have to wait until that operation is finished. So what is usually done is that you just mark the block as dirty, and then uh, it can do kind of a cleanup operation, this garbage collection later when, when it's idle, or even can do that in the background while you're actually writing other stuff. Then one thing that is predominant in kind of managed flash stuff is of course also the right amplification factor. So the problem is that the actual data that you write to flash to the cell and the data that you send from the host down is basically not the same amount because due to, for example, different program and erase size, you oftentimes have to kind of move data around even more than that you actually really need to write. So internally, it will have to move stuff around very much. And another reason, because it needs erasing before rewriting, so you cannot just, you know, you have to erase a whole block. And all the other data that is in that block, you somehow have to move it around. That's those memory management features we covered before, the wear leveling, garbage collection, all that adds to that. And the typical write amplification factor in nowadays EMMC, a good average is around four. But of course, that heavily depends on the usage scenario. So one important thing is that uh, kind of the data size is selected in an optimal fashion uh, concerning the page size, basically. So if you have totally small files or things like that, that it will be a much worse kind of write amplification factor. Sure. Yes. In average, more or less, that's what happens because, well, if you only write new data, then that is not the problem. But if you now have a system, you overwrite data, you know what I mean? And, and it has to kind of move stuff around. Overall, you will have much more that will have to be written internally. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And all the old data you have to kind of move it and only that page that you changed, that actually then changes. So maybe that means to some degree they're keeping the, the inside the flash uh, management controller or whatever, they're keeping two copies of certain sections of data as the uh, usage? Well, usually you only have kind of one place where you have the hot data, you know what I mean? But of course it's still in there and the other block is kind of marked as dirty and then it will clean it up again. Where did that four number come from? Well, that's some average, I think that one I found in some kind of Toshiba uh, application note. But of course, like I said, that heavily depends on the usage scenario and the idea is now with our tooling that we actually analyze that and uh, yeah. Is this something that they're designed for? Like they say our goal is to get four or is it something that they just designed and the Well, that's a good question. That's more a question of this whole kind of management algorithms they're using. The good thing is because that technology is kind of matured now, you actually find a lot of papers about uh, these exact algorithms uh, online. So I read so through some of those, but of course it's kind of quite abstract stuff. And 
I'm not sure how much they, well, I guess that Micron or Toshiba or so that they actually run some tests and even maybe tweak all that stuff to actually get some kind of better value. But that, because it heavily depends on the usage scenario, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of tricky, of course. But I know that uh, there are certain of those algorithms they even kind of analyze and have different kind of sections and even try to kind of do that intelligently, whether you have small files or bigger files and things like that to, to get better values there. But that's really kind of, uh, especially in the EMMC, that is kind of a black box, of course. You can kind of hope that the vendor did that in a smart way, basically. But the good thing that we will see later is that you can get some numbers about this kind of low level stuff that is going on and you can then basically, yeah, for lifetime estimation, you can use that, of course. Even th so, you don't know the exact algorithm how they do that internally, but if you know how many times then a block actually gets erased and stuff like that, you, you basically can run your usage scenario and then basically look at those counters and, and then kind of uh, predict what it will do, yeah. okay? So the EMMC, it's basically also called managed NAND. So it's uh, basically raw NAND die with an uh, uncompanying NAND controller. So it abstracts a lot of that away, like I said before, it's kind of a black box. You don't know all the details. The nice thing about it is that you can use regular block operations, basically. So you can run regular file systems like an X4 file system and don't have to worry about any of these details. The latest, it's a JEDEC standard. The latest one is 5.1. And the example EMMC that I will be covering is this uh, Micron part that uh, is four gig in size, has 1,024 blocks and an average lifespan of 3,000 write erase cycles. And it's produced in 15 nanometer process. That's more or less pretty standard for embedded systems. So how does the MMC protocol work? It's basically a bus. You have command clock and seven data lines. Command is kind of a serial command response channel. And uh, data is the parallel kind of read-write data. And it also has some CRC. And then you can have single or multiple block read-write operations, basically. Then you have the register set. I'm not going to go in much further detail here. What is interesting is this extended card or device specific data that contains more information and we will see that uh, also that they added at a certain point uh, also some lifespan information there. This is what is called the JEDEC standard health reporting. So basically you get a device lifetime estimation of type A and type B. Both show in increments of 10% basically what the device current state is. And in our case, with the Micron EMMC, they use the type A to refer to the pseudo SLC blocks, and the type B is the regular MLC blocks. And then also overall, you get the so-called pre-end of life information. That is basically, it has, it knows about three states. The normal state is up to 80% of the reserved blocks are consumed. Then there is a warning state, that is if you go above that 80% threshold. And then they also know an urgent uh, state where you have more than 90% consumed. And that stuff got introduced with the standard version 5.0. Uh, the problem with it is a little bit that maybe for a live product, it's okay, of course. You could use that to at least know kind of when <laughs> it will gonna go and die. But if you now 
in the process of creating a product and you would kind of like to know, well, how, how long will it survive? You have to do really long kind of runs of stuff to even have it kind of increment the full 10%. So that's why for our purpose, it's not very well suited, basically. But the nice thing, it's there on all uh, vendors if they use the 5.0 spec. Then there is the, basically a vendor proprietary health report. In our case, the Micron one. They have a technical application note about this device health report, they call it. And uh, they have more information. For example, you get bad block counters. You get the factory bad blocks, the runtime bad blocks. You get how many remaining spare blocks you have. And also you get some kind of logging per block when they failed a program or erase operation with the page address of where it actually failed. Then you also get some block erase counters. You get a minimum, maximum, and average overall. And you can even also get per block. So all the 1,024 blocks, it will give you the, the exact number how many times that even got erased. And of course, you also get some more in internal data about the block configuration, so the physical address of each block, and also the pseudo SLC versus uh, multi-level cell kind of configuration, because that is actually uh, user configurable in this case. So the user can actually say whether he want the whole device or parts of the device in certain uh, modes. And how to access it? You can use this general command, uh, also called the uh, command 56. But what is even meant by flash health? So basically it's about the percentage of the capacity that already is worn out. And this endurance, you can calculate it either number of blocks times the average block lifespan. So in our case, that is this 1024 by 3000, so, so we get some kind of three million block erases you can do during the lifetime of this device. Or oftentimes, it's also more common in the SSD world, they talk about how many terabytes you can write. So it's the endurance, the block size, times the number of blocks, times the average lifespan. So in our case, that four gig device, you can write 12 terabytes. And once you've written 12 terabytes, basically, if you write more, stuff will go bad. So how can we monitor the flash health in Linux? One set of utilities, the MMC utils, it's basically software to extract some meaningful information from the UMMC devices. What it allows you is basically reading that XCSD data that contains this information. And as we saw before, since standard 5.0, this includes this lifespan as defined by JEDEC. And as an example, I show you here you can first read it to even figure out whether what kind of standard version your device supports. So in our case, it's 5.0, so it's fine. It should have that information. And then if you, for example, grab for that thing, you get, that's how it gets presented. In this case, I have a one everywhere, it means it's a new device, so it's within the first 10% of wear, basically. And also the, the end of life, it's still in normal case. Okay. Then the vendor proprietary health report, as mentioned before, you can use the command 56. So you could, for example, extend MLC utils and kind of go through and read that data out like that. That way you could read bad block counts, erase counts, and all this kind of information. Okay, 
Another way to do that is we can uh, use proprietary tool. So in the uh, Micron case, they have a, a tool called EMC Parm, which allows you to read that stuff out. Then the IO tracking, I mean, somehow we want to relate that information with what actually went on, what we wrote and things like that. So it's a useful indicator. It's also interesting to know which kind of application is causing most wear, things like that. And that data, like I mentioned, we use as input data for the wear estimation model. And there is, of course, it's independent of any kind of EMMC information. And you could use it for any kind of flash technology. To know how to do that, we have to look quickly at the IO stack. So basically, you have the file operations. Somewhere in user space, you have stuff that gets written. It does some system calls. It ends up in the IO stack. And somewhere at the bottom, it will actually write it down to the flash. The block device IO stack looks like that. I'm not going to go in much more detail there. Of course, the question is why can we not just monitor it from user space? The problem is a little bit, well, it's not very accurate because we see it here. I mean, it's actually doing some advanced stuff. It has an IO scheduler. It might not commit stuff immediately, cache it. There are layers of caches. So that's why it's not very well suited to, to just look at the user space rights, basically, because you don't know whether they end up on the flash or not. So measuring real IO rights, there are a lot of places in the kernel where you can kind of hook up. The question is how and where will it, where, when do we know that it actually will hit the flash? IOTOP, that would be the one to use from the, IO, from the user space. It's easy to use, but like I said, it's not quite accurate for what we want to do. On the other hand, block trace allows you to get more information on that, but it gives you basically too much information and then you can use filtering and you basically need to know which is a good filter to actually, that tells you whether it's now really gonna hit the device or not. And for that, you're gonna use the complete flag, basically. And how do we now estimate this lifespan? So we can basically lock the flash health and the IO tracking, and we can then correlate the two over time. So the lifespan in seconds is basically the endurance divided by the average global block erase count that it already got. Or if you want to look at the write rate, the endurance divided by the adjusted average kind of write rate you have. One remark I want to do is that this whole Lifespan stuff is strongly affected by temperature. So you have to make sure when you do any kind of such uh, yeah, measurements that you actually also consider that. So if you want to run it at kind of industrial temp, 85 degrees, you also will have to do all your kind of testing in that same environment. Otherwise, you will get quite different numbers at the end. Or you will estimate something and it will end up that it will die two times faster in the field because you forgot to take that into account. Just be very careful of that. Okay. So we have the flash analytics tool. It's basically a tool developed under the Toradex Labs umbrella. We're trying to abstract away this whole complexity that we talked about now. And it mainly 
targets application developers that, of course, they don't want to know all these details. They just write their application and they want to know, well, will that survive five years on that device or, or what will happen? Or do I have to kind of adjust how much data do we have to change how we do that, things like that. The current prediction model that we are using is just implemented using regular linear regression, basically. So we assume that it will be linear, whatever we calculated and measured. Okay, I can do a quick demo. I have a board here. It's a, our Aster board with a Colbury iMix 6. I can quickly hook that up. So I use Ethernet to get to the stuff. And unfortunately, I came back a little late from <laughs> lunch, so I well, it should be quick. Just plug that in. This one can be powered just by USB, so let's see. Probably need some kind of a... Uh, excuse me? No, it's, uh, it will be in the slides as well. You can just go to the Toradex lab thing and download it. And it's, it's free to use, yeah. Let's see, probably there is a way to increase the font. Ooh. Doesn't want to do it. Let's see. Ah. There you go. Okay. And let's fire it up. Voila. That's now running. Torizon and uh, we have the flash tool basically containerized. Let's see how that goes. Then on the other hand to access the data using Mala. We're using the browser, let's see. I can start that whole thing connect to it that we also see what it's kind of doing. Probably takes a few seconds. There you go. Let's see. And usually at the beginning it will not have any data available, of course, because it also it needs some. You can look at how much writing is going on, and here you get that whole uh, flash information. So this one is that regular standard information. So you see it's also still in the 10%, and it is still in the normal case. Over here you, you actually get the vendor-specific stuff, blocky rice count, yeah, so you see the average, so it's a fairly new device I pulled out of the cupboard. And you could even also look here at all the blocks. And you see that in this case, it has most of the blocks in regular MLC mode. And bad blocks, only a very small number of the bad blocks is used yet. And like I said, it, it doesn't want to show anything now because it doesn't re really have any data yet. I mean, if no writing is going on, it's kind of hard to predict. So. We have to first call some writing. Let's see how we can do that. I can, for example, uh, SSH in. Uh, we also increase the font here a little bit. So. Very well, and let's see, 
for example, we can use some DD to just write some random data. Let's go back to the browser, check again what that guy is doing. So it doesn't have any data here. We look at the write statistic. Here you see this one, for example, it's the JBD, so it's basically just the, uh, how you say, the, from the journaling. I mean, journaling is going on. It's probably writing a little bit of log data, something. It's, but the system is more or less idle now. And now we go back here, we write, start writing some data, and then we will hopefully see that appear here. That would be the idea. It should uh, refresh every 10 seconds, so let's see. Not yet. <laughs> let's hope that it's not a Murphy thing. Ah, there you go. So you clearly see the DD. And it's kind of nicely writing away. I mean, we're kind of unthrottled writing to the flash now, basically. So it gives a nice little wear. So what does it now do? Ah, there you go. So if you go full throttle on that one, it basically it will not survive very long. And most people don't really realize that. I mean, you can wear out the flash within Weeks, basically, it's really, I mean, so you have to be very careful. So as an application developer, you now would really have to kind of make sure that you de design your whole system in a way that it actually meets whatever your marketing might have in mind, how long it should survive or not. And of course, it would be a kind of a bad thing if it, you know, you have them all in the field and a couple months later they all call you and say, well, it kind of died. What happened? So that's the idea, basically. OK. Any questions? Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, like I said, I mean, it's in this case now we only implemented the, the Micron one. In theory, you could just use the JEDEX standard one. The problem is a little bit you would have to really, depending on your application, you would have to run it maybe for a month or, or even longer to even get one ten percent increment that you even know. I mean, because before you don't know it, you can run it forever. I mean. It's useless, so that is a little bit the problem. Okay, Mark. Yeah. Ah, oh yeah, I totally forgot. Yeah. Otherwise, we don't have it uh, in the video. The does it work? Well, I can also repeat it. Just go ahead. Okay, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, uh, in terms of like the, uh, how long the unit, or how long the device will last, mm -hmm. um, now uh, the endurance is also a measure of how well the wear leveling inside of the chip itself works. Yeah, and so do we just take it, uh, you know, for granted that it will work well, or do we measure that at all? Or? Well, of course, you kind of have to assume that they don't have like the worst box and stuff in that stuff. but. If you look at the real low level, we really look at the blocks how many times, so it doesn't really matter how they implemented it. If you assume that your workload stays the same, it should basically also have the same effect, you know what I mean? And also this, the right amplification factor, everything should basically be accounted for. But I agree, one kind of dangerous thing with that is that if you basically have a new device, it probably will behave much nicer than once you have kind of really written everything and it's a kind of a mess and it has to do much more cleanup and things like that. That's why you probably will have to run it for a little while. 
You know what I mean? You, you, it's kind of, the demo I had here, I mean, just to run like a couple minutes, that, that probably won't cut it, you know what I mean? But because we really look at the low level data, it should take that basically in account. But of course, like I said, it doesn't know whether the algorithm will suddenly have troubles once it's more written, things like that, that is kind of difficult. So for example, is there a standard for querying just the number of erases per block? Exactly, exactly. There is or yeah, isn't? Yeah, yeah that, that's this, oh, there uh, is. this vendor health report gives you all that data. You know, the, the vendor proprietary health report, it, it gives you all that data. Let's see. Here, micron proprietary. I mean, it has every block, how many erase I, I mean, you get all that information. Yeah. The problem is that each vendor is allowed to implement that however they like, and there is no standard that says that they have to include any of those elements. Yeah. Well, this one is anyway, this is, is the vendor proprietary. So they don't have to do that. And, but even the JEDEC one, it's not fully defined. Like I said, there is this AB. What that AB means, that's kind of up to the vendor again. I have a question. Yes? Have you investigated to see how many of the vendors are opting to put this health information in their vendor-specific area? Well, basically, all the vendors that we so far used they do have some ways of getting to that data, but it's everybody does it differently, basically. And you have to kind of invest in your tooling, and, and but it's possible. Is there a discussion going on with the vendors to express our desire <laughs> to have a uh, mechanism to accomplish this? Well, I think that probably on the top level, that is what uh, what boiled down to this JEDEC standard stuff. But, and like I said, for a live device, it might be okay. But for kind of to estimate stuff, it's, it's kind of useless because it's not very fine-grained. So basically, I think what would have to happen is that in, in JEDEC 5.2 or whatever not, they would have to really extend that, that I don't know, it's not a super secret. It should just allow you to really get that number from every block, and that will be enough because that's how we do it now. I mean, but it, it's really it, it depends on the on the on the vendor basically. So far, it's not standardized. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you try to kill some of those EMMC and see if the? Yes, exactly. We actually run a bunch of them in the, this continuous kind of. Uh, writing thing, and it's more or less like we saw here. I mean, the good thing is that none of them went bad before kind of what we calculated here. Okay. But after three months, you, you basically have various issues. It's also very different how they behave. I mean, some suddenly don't take any writes anymore and just return errors. Some kind of just continue to work, but the data kind of suddenly is a little bit random and things like that. So it clearly shows that even that is not so fully standardized. Yeah, pretty much cross vendor, exactly. But of course, I mean, we did, I think we did around, I don't know, two, three dozens of devices, not hundreds. So it's, it's kind of, we don't know, but we took more than just one per vendor, and they kind of behave the same. <laughs> yes? Uh, I'm really curious uh, if this also works for standard uh, laptops or desktops using solid state drives, or if there well, are Well, in this tools. case, you actually have standardized stuff, you know what I mean? You have the smart information, usually, and I think I think with the, how you call it, the NVMe stuff, they have a new, whatever they call it, I forgot, but they, those guys kind of have that information, yes. Since we're talking about EMMC and vendors, you mentioned temperature. Do you have any insights into the performance capabilities of a consumer part versus an automotive grade part versus an industrial grade part when it comes to this aspect? Yeah, of that's a very, very good question. Because I remember, I mean, I'm now in the industry quite a while, and at the beginning, 
when we still had a lot of kind of raw end stuff and we were thinking, well, should we now do the CMMC or not? There weren't even any industrial or automotive grade devices available yet. So that shows clearly it's probably not totally easy. And like I said, uh, it also heavily depends. So that's why you should really run, to estimate it, you should run it at that whatever temperature that you also think that your device, your product will run in the field at the end. Yeah, I just found that with my own part qualification, like the data sheets don't really get into much. Like they'll talk about average write performance, yeah, read performance, no, they don't but they talk won't about go that. into that's true. MTBF. Well, it's in theory, it's it's that thing I showed here. Basically, you have to kind of ask, what does it mean? To, I mean, when, if they say 3,000 erase write cycles, usually what that means is that after the 3,000 the data that you've written still survives one year. That's actually, they, they use this data retention. And that is basically really the biggest problem. So that time will decrease. So the problem will be if you write it at 85 degree, basically you can still do these 3,000 write erase cycles, but the problem is the data probably after a month it will be bad. And, and now the, to counteract to that, you kind of have to re rewrite the data. But that, of course, will use some of these precious <laughs> erase cycles. So it's kind of a trade-off in between that, basically. But yeah, they don't really mention that in the data sheets. Thanks. Question. Actually, in response to yours, uh, we have to qualify each part from each manufacturer independent of the data sheet because we do not see the data sheets reflect any semblance of reality. No. <laughs> uh, well, I think we all do it the same, more or less. Like, I mean, you have to really run the stuff. To, you don't get that data. I do have a question. Yes. Um, EMMC and SD have a lot of elements in common. Uh, do you have any information about uh, health on SD cards as opposed to direct to EMMC? Well, I think that is rather tricky, and that is also why there are these special industrial kind of great SD cards, and those suddenly do have that. So we were in discussions with some of those guys, for example, Swissbit, uh, companies like that, or I mean, even Kingston does some special industrial grade. And there, they do have tools where you can read that out. But in detail, how exactly they do it and stuff like that, I don't uh, remember right now. Plus, I also don't think it, it's standardized. It's, it's, I think a regular SD card, I'm not aware that there is some way to kind of get that data. There's nothing in the specification yeah. today. OK. Very well. Then I guess that's it. I want to actually uh, respond to sure. him. So we did uh, some investigation on the SD card because there was no inside information like this. And so we designed a tool to destroy the SD card uh, in terms of how many write events we were doing on the field. So, and we found actually that some vendors are really, really good with respect to some others. So uh, SunDisk, if I, I don't want to make like any cut, but SunDisk has a, a, an incredible lifespan. Uh, in terms of number of writes that we did, like writing on a database like any other application. So yeah, we, we did all the time, but we have to basically destroy the SD card all the time. Yeah, right, so <laughs> I think that that's the, that's the way to go. Well, at the end, I guess we would have to kind of stand together and, and pressure them more that they would actually kind of standardize all that stuff. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.